What I can say is technology developed really fast in the last you know year and a half. And also the way we use technology has developed really fast. So we're not going to put up with bad virtual events. If the technology is not working properly, if it's not well constructed, we're going to log off pretty quickly. The bar has been raised for all types of events. And I think, yeah, that sort of engagement, that getting things really, really interesting, no matter how you're consuming the event is really important. I don't think that every event is going to go hybrid. I think hybrid, particularly if you really mean hybrid, like simultaneous and, and you know, high investment, high production value hybrid is, is going to be exclusive for you know, events that can really be like TV, events that can have that kind of production and where that kind of production can be done and the on-site experience still be positive. I do think that virtual events are definitely here to stay. And I think that a lot of events just make more sense virtually. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Trifan Events. I am your host, Anka Trifan. And on today's show, I have the pleasure of hosting Miguel Nevsh, Event MB's editor-in-chief, who likes to describe himself as a curious creator and caring curator of computerized content and a conscious connector of charismatic characters. And I just realized that this entire phrase has a bunch of C's. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I'm going to have to ask Miguel about that. Miguel lives and breeds the event tech sector and is deeply engaged in the global online community of event professionals. He is a Portuguese soul who built a career in the UK and is now raising a young family in Southern Denmark. Tune into today's episode as Miguel and I will be discussing and demystifying the future of events as he sees it, what a proper hybrid event should look like, content planning for the full event cycle, as well as the approval process that goes into generating meaningful content that informs, involves, and entertains, and much, much more. And now I am super excited and just a tiny bit, you know, nervous to welcome Miguel Nevsh in and kick this conversation off. Welcome to the show, Miguel. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And let me tell you, there's not a lot of people that make me nervous. I'm not sure what's happening over here. <laughs> <laughs> Would you give our audience a quick rundown of who you are and maybe what you're most passionate about these days? Perfectly. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. It's really nice to be here, Anka. Sorry that I make you nervous. It's not really intentional. I'm trying to be called <laughs> and collected. So I'm Miguel Neves, uh, Portuguese. I've been in the events industry for about 15 years. Uh, I started in Portugal Portugal, kind of by accident. I used to be in the music industry. Uh, like a lot of people ended up kind of moving over to events. I tried to open up a company when I was pretty young, almost 15 years ago, and I didn't succeed. It was actually a big disaster. And I realized that organizing events and selling the organization of events are, are two very different things. And although I was pretty confident in my skills as an organizer, my selling skills and my network were very limited. So I actually ended up in England uh, doing a master's degree at University of Westminster, Conference and Events Management was the name of the course. Very consciously kind of building my network and trying to understand how the industry really works. I was in England for about 10 years, worked as a planner after that, and also then joined the IMEX team. So the team that organizes IMEX in Frankfurt and IMEX America, they're based in Hove uh, next to Brighton mm -hmm. in England. And I worked with them for six years on mainly social media content for the event industry. After that, I, me and my wife, we bought a camper van, went traveling, and she's Danish. So we ended up in Denmark after... Uh, our adventure. And I had my own company for about three years doing marketing for events, similar to what I was doing at IMAX. And then uh, since February, I've been the editor in chief of Event MB, previously known as Event Manager Blog, started by uh, Julius Solaris, who I've known for a very long time. And uh, it's been an honor to kind of take over from him from that founding role and uh, and take over the, the publication that is Event MB. So it's, it's been quite a ride. Um, no kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, we have a big reach. There's a lot of community. There's there's a lot of people and uh, big shoes to fill. So I'm still learning a lot every day, and uh, it's exciting, but it is it's intense at, at the same time. Absolutely, and I know that this is just like a very encapsulated version of like your life story uh, that you just like you're like I spit this out so many times that I'm kind of like used to this, but there's so many other you know little tiny chapters in there that probably you know were kind of the highlight sure. or the low point of your or, you know, journey, because I mean, we all got that going on, right? For so sure. And, and I think I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I, I like, like I mentioned in my introduction, I mentioned low point. And, and I think not many people are comfortable mentioning their low yeah. points. And I think that's really important because you learn a lot from those. If you always, if you always get away with things, you never really learn because you just sort of keep doing what you're doing. Right. So it's when I, when I'm faced with sort of failure, that's when I really learn. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's really important to talk about these things openly and in ways that people can, can learn from and kind of get benefits from. And I love that because I certainly connect better with people that admit that they had, you know, failures and mistakes in their life and that only helped them grow to a better version of themselves. Because if you just, you know, try to throw it all under the rug and pretend like it never happened, then you also miss the lesson <laughs> that, you know, hopefully you were supposed to learn because of the whatever, you know, incident, whatever yeah. happened, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of other people that can relate to that and say, hey, if I didn't have all those things, all the mistakes that I've done in my past life, I don't think that I would be the person that I am today. And that's huge. You know what I mean? Totally so agree. I love that you started music. I would love to get more into that, but we don't have a lot of time <laughs> to like dive into each chapter of your life. But maybe on another episode, another time, we're going to, you know, dive into that. Right now, you know, at the time that we're recording this episode, the event industry, especially in the last week or so, I feel like seems to have been like just going yet again into like this panic mode and uh, while many event professionals have been kind of dismissive of virtual events as an alternative to in person i think we all need to remember that digital has been a huge part of the events for a very long time way before the pandemic i mean i remember it goes back all the way when i got married i streamed my my wedding because my family is in europe as well so i was here they were there i'm like how do we solve this problem since they can't join the wedding so having this option has always been part of our events and what has happened, I think it has not just highlighted it as an opportunity, but also accelerated a lot of the technology that comes with it. And now we have the opportunity to reach a much wider audience as a means to also be more sustainable and climate friendly and be aware of our footprint. If there's anything that I would like to get to here is that my message, like everything that I try to say during this season is not to be afraid to embrace this change and make this, you know, dive into virtual, into hybrid. Now, as we try to incorporate virtual into our in-person, you know, whatever that might look like, and we call it hybrid, or maybe we just drop all the names and we just call our events events again, right? My question to you is, if this was an easy fit and everything was possible, what are your thoughts on what a proper, as in, you know, hybrid event that captured the best of the virtual and in-person event experience? A hybrid event, what should that look like? What could that feel like? Yeah, big question. And, and I think I agree with you. I think we, we should not be fearful of the virtual side of events, but it's a important to also to acknowledge that a lot of people that work in the industry uh, can only really work with physical events. You know, you have the, the venue people, you have the catering people, you have all people in the industry that just can't survive on virtual events. And still the, the business model around virtual events is unproven. You know, mm -hmm. we can run successful events, we can do all these sort of things. But in terms of the business model, uh, even just getting the ticket pricing right and get for the event when you when you do these kind of productions, it's not easy. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. And, and of course, let's say we can and we can figure out a way to do that. And I think we, sh we will be able to. It just takes some time to figure that out. I think when it comes down to events, for me, the important part of the event is, is the gathering of people, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's a wedding, yeah. personal celebration, a scientific event, academic, a trade show, whatever it is, you're gathering people together, uh, maybe not physically, maybe virtually. You're, you're bringing people together that care about something. 
there's a common kind of thing that they care about, right? And yeah. so you bring them together at a specific moment in time because the magic happens when there is all these people focused on that topic, focused on that thing at that specific time. And so I think we shouldn't forget this because, you know, there's a lot of talk now about events being all year round, you know, 365 days of the year events where we're always in an event. And I don't think that's true. I think that if it's an event, then it's a, then it's a peak, you know, it's a peak of interest. You can have different things happening. You can have webinars, you can have other things happening throughout the year that sort of continue the conversation. But if you want a big amount of people to pay attention to something, you know, and come together at one moment in time, you have to make that moment in time special. So I think the secret here is really to make it special for the different audiences. Mm -hmm. And I say different because there can be, although we talk about sort of in person and we talk about online, within that, there can be different audiences as well, right? If you're at a, a big in person event, and a big kind of auditorium and kind of watching a keynote, that's relatively the same for everybody in that keynote. But if you're out in the foyer because you're a sponsor and you want to be outside having meetings, it's a different experience. It can still be good because you sort of chose to be there. And we, as event professionals, we understand that sort of in-person event side of things and we understand how to make the most of it. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that all in-person events are perfect. You know, there's so yeah. many things that don't actually work well at in-person events. And although we're sort of fantasizing about them right now because we miss them, it's like, well, yeah. you know, sometimes they're really uncomfortable. Sometimes you have to do a lot of small talk with people that you don't like or you don't really feel comfortable being there. They can be unsafe. They can, they can pollute. There's all sorts of things that aren't necessarily perfect about those events. And we want to make that experience really good. Now, for the online portion, it's also important to make that experience positive. And while we kind of, the idea of having a hybrid event where everything's happening at the same time and then the online audience really enjoys it and there's all this kind of interaction, sometimes that's not the best way to give the online audience the best experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually a fan of experimenting with not doing things live, for example, not exactly at the same time. So mm -hmm. for example, you know, having a live keynote for the live audience and then not live streaming that because the live stream, unless you have sufficient resources, can be a little clunky. It can be a little difficult to get it right. If you want to make it into a TV production, you need a TV production sized team to work with. You're complex. saying budget and having exactly. that high quality TV broadcast doesn't necessarily fit within the same phrase. It does as long as you have a business model that can support it. Mm -hmm. You know, TV works, you know, TV is expensive to produce, but it works because there's big advertising money. There's, there's complex business models that make it work. Most events don't have that unless you're talking about big sporting events or really, really powerful business events. They don't have that kind of audience and they can't attract that kind of sponsorship. So you're better off creating maybe not a simultaneous experience. Maybe it is simultaneous. I'm just saying that there's other solutions yeah. that might create a, a better experience. So if, if not being exactly simultaneous, maybe there's a 10 minute delay or something like that where you can edit it and you can make it a little bit better and you can make the online audience have a really curated kind of really good experience that might make the online audience really enjoy it a lot more. You know, and then you're really trying to get the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, for content, it's relatively simple, but it's, it is hard to do well. When it comes to networking, which is one of the big things for in-person events, that's really hard to do online, right? And especially if you want to try and connect between people who are on site and online, I find that really, I find it really hard to believe that people do that and the people on site are kind of willing to stop everything and speak to someone that's online because technology always gets slightly in the way. I totally agree with you. What I'm trying to guess, maybe bring your opinion on, uh, see what you think about is what if the online is just the the catalyst to creating those connections that you would then meet in person, because it is true. Like sometimes meeting in person is hard for some people like introverts, right? But then also meeting in person, someone that you've maybe known a little bit something about, it can also be so much easier to just get to the conversation, get to the topic, get to whatever you're trying to accomplish, right? Meeting Anybody for the first time is, is tricky. I think even online, you know, there are some tools that do the sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, random conversations where you're at an event. Oh, and I hate those. Sort of, <laughs> see? And, and that's my point. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we kind of say, hey, meeting online is easier. And then you, you kind of ease into face-to-face. -face, and it, it can be really weird to meet someone you don't know online, and especially if you don't have any context or, or if they're trying to sell you something and you're not the right, you know, it's not the right fit. You're kind of like, thanks, but... No, you know, and it's, 
I don't know. I feel like in person, you're sort of more rehearsed to find your excuses. Like I have to use the restroom now. And then you don't come back that way. <laughs> when you're online, you could just press, you know, switch off and, you know, just disconnect. But Sorry, I had technical to. challenges. <laughs> exactly. So I think the, the, the kind of the, the holistic answer to all of this is to, is to really build special moments. And I think part of building special moments is sometimes around content sometimes around discussing content. So not watching a keynote, but going into a breakout with other people that watched a keynote or are interested in a specific topic and discussing that. So you skip the small talk, you skip the where's the weather like where you are, that kind of thing. You can still talk about that, but you don't need to. And you go into a conversation about what you just heard or a topic that's of interest and you build those relationships. And what I think is really interesting is very few events do that. You know, most online events focus on the virtual, on the big keynote, on that kind of thing. And then sort of go, okay, now there's a trade show and you can go and visit the trade show mm -hmm. booths. And data tells us that people don't do that. People just don't go and visit the trade shows, or at least not to the same extent as in in person, because in person there's coffee, there's mm -hmm. cocktails on the boots, there's games, mm -hmm. there's things happening that are kind of interesting and fun and you mm -hmm. want to touch something and you want to kind of experiment. Virtually, you know, a virtual booth is not too different from a website, or, you know, mm -hmm. or somebody's LinkedIn page or something like that. So I'm like, there's not a huge kind of attraction. And the other thing is virtually you're, you know, one click away from your emails. You, know, yeah. you didn't travel anywhere. You didn't go somewhere with that person. So I believe that the real answer with virtual is, is to really kind of build the engagement into the virtual experience. And if we have to sort of not be live at the same time as the in-person audience, then I'd rather take that risk. I'd rather make that choice. As long as people don't be like, oh, I'll just watch everything later on demand. Once you get to that point of, I'll watch everything later on demand, then you've lost everybody because I don't think that people actually watch things later on demand. Sometimes when I really, really, you know, think that something is interesting, I would put it on my calendar, but you're right. It comes down to what's the priority for me, even that day during that time slot, will I make it a priority to watch this content on demand versus having to take a meeting? Yeah. You know, so many of us have folders or bookmarks of content that we want to watch on demand and it keeps growing. <laughs> and then it's very hard to be like, I'm not going to do the work that I'm supposed to do today because I want to catch yeah. up on that thing I was supposed to watch two weeks ago. It doesn't happen. And that's, I think, where one of the reasons that I think podcasts do so well is that because they're built as on-demand content. It's like when you're in the car, when you're traveling somewhere, when something's happening, have a listen. And I, and I think that's a great like low friction content uh, delivery format. Absolutely. Here's one thing that I personally like to do. It's like do a little bit of A-B comparison. And I do this on my social media. Like I constantly run, you know, type of like campaigns where it's like A and B, A, B, just to see which one is more successful than other. So I was doing the same thing for a couple of conferences that I was a vendor for a virtual booth. And mm -hmm. two examples in which I set up my booth, like I normally do. And, and I just created the normal content, whatever. Here's some raffles, here's some giveaways, here's some information whatever and you're right like some of the return on investment on that has been very minimal i mean like you say like do i do that do i visit a website it's like kind of the same but then on a different run through i created a very short video introduction welcome video hey welcome to my booth i'm so glad you're here blah 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 one minute super short and i could see the return eight times more people clicking on that because even the setup of how i guess the back end was when you hover over that booth you would see actually a video pop up so i think it's important you know how things are set up as well but it was just so interesting to see that people were more interested and engaged with your face on there welcoming them versus just throwing a bunch of like brochures, digital stuff that they could click on anywhere else. And maybe if anybody's listening and they are, you know, sponsoring booths or they are some sort of a virtual vendor, they should possibly try that because I've seen in my experience how that could work. So with that in mind, I want to segue into 
content because you are a creator of content and that's basically the bread and butter of any virtual and hybrid event content is king right we've heard this statement mm -hmm. many times over the last i don't know 18 months or so how do you evaluate and approach the approval process that is required for an event that generates content that's creative inspiring and useful yeah that's it's one bit at a time but i'm i think the most important part is probably the A-B testing. You know, I think I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's really important that you test things out. The best marketing plans that I know, the best communication plans are ones that take into consideration the feedback. I'm on the side of social media and communications where the number of followers and the number of likes doesn't really matter. Like that's not something that drives business. Mm -hmm. However, Social media in particular has this sort of, I call it a mix of psychology and technology, mm -hmm. right? So when you post something on social media, you have to understand the technology. So you have to know like on, you know, simple example on Instagram, links don't work. So you don't post link on, on Instagram. I still yes, see you... so many posts with links. I'm like, uh, link below. I'm like, uh, I can't yeah, even copy and exactly. paste that link. <laughs> Exactly. And especially because Instagram is usually on your phone, it just doesn't make sense. And just the thought of sending somebody to a link that may not be good on phones either, even when it does work, when you do the link in bio, it's not the best experience. On LinkedIn, you have sort of three lines of text on every post, and then people have to click to open more. So your first three lines are super important. That's the technology. That's understanding the technology. The psychology is like, those three lines have to be really good. You know, you wrote three lines, you knew that people would only see those three lines, but those three lines don't say anything to the audience, then they're not going to want to see it. If the image that you're using isn't appealing, it's not interesting to that audience, they're not going to care. So you have to get that balance right of psychology and technology to really make your social media or communication, any type of communication, I think that's important. With social media, it's just a bit more instant when it comes to the technology side. And there's more sort of little tricks that are similar, like the, the, the LinkedIn then is, is really the above the fold and below the fold from traditional newspapers and things, but it's the LinkedIn version of it because every post you only see the three lines. Um, now, but going back to my original point, what I think is super important is that you test things out, that you post something and then you see that's where the likes kind of come in because not that many people will comment or share but like is relatively simple, right? You just click the heart or you click the thumbs up and that's sort of a pretty easy indication. And if you get enough sort of likes on a post, then it can go viral. And, and when we're talking about sort of B2B events, viral is never millions necessarily, but it's, you know, then, then that post can be quite successful. So it depends on getting kind of interest in a short amount of time. And then the social media channels tend to show those posts to more people. So it's really important to get that right and get that initial interest. But the most important thing is that you're kind of listening and checking in on the posts. And then when you see something that works, you double down on that, right? And that's where I think making like a really complex communications and marketing plan, it's great to have to really plan things out, but you need to build in that space to kind of bet on something once you figure out it's working. Because if you stick to a rigid plan, that's just wasting resources. But when I had my own company, I posted quite often on LinkedIn, especially when I was traveling at events, I found that worked really well. And I went through a period of making little videos about things that I would advise my clients. So tips for social media, tips for marketing, and they didn't work. Like my LinkedIn audience, which is a professional audience, I had, I don't know, maybe 4,000 followers or something at that mm. point, didn't care. Mm. The tips that I was giving them was, was what I would kind of tell clients. And I was trying to do it in a very kind of human way. Yeah. They didn't care about that. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation, while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. To find out how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com.
But what I found worked really well was taking pictures of on my travels and just talking about what I was doing. So like, let's say I was going to, uh, for example, I went to Helsinki to do a, a couple of lectures, a couple of talks at events. Mm -hmm. And I would say, hey, I'm in Helsinki. And I, you know, there's a few tricks. Like I tried to take the video in, a, in an iconic place. So it was like, you know, with the town hall behind me, something like that. But I would just say, hey, I'm here and I'm going to be speaking with these people, you know, this group. And I'm going to mm -hmm. be talking about this. If you're watching, let me know. I'd love to connect. Um, yeah. And that's it. Like really short video, like a minute. And those worked really well. I have a number of theories why they worked well. Mm -hmm. and but, but I think that they worked well because A, because my audience sort of got to know me and they enjoyed going on a ride with me. Mm -hmm. Like this is Miguel's adventure as a small business owner and he's hustling and he's out there and he's doing things. So they didn't necessarily want me to be like, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. They wanted me to just take them on a journey with them and be like, hey, I'm here to do this. And what was interesting for me was I kept on getting comments from people saying, oh, you're traveling a lot. Like when I would meet them face to face, like you're traveling a lot. You must be very successful. Well done, mm -hmm. you know. And so I realized the recipe for my videos, the best one I could find was that one. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, like giving people tips when they didn't ask for them, sometimes people don't want tips. They're not looking for tips necessarily, yeah. but they're kind of interested in following my journey. So they enjoyed that. And I realized that the effect on my business, the effect on me getting clients was just as good because ultimately I'm trying to give tips out on social media to attract clients, to kind of show my skills. Yeah. But by publicly talking about the clients that I acquired and, and the things that I was doing, that had exactly the same effect. You know, I was still, you know, by default, I was sort of successful because I was doing these things. Yeah. Of course, I didn't, you know, make videos of myself bored in my office or working <laughs> hard in the dark or anything like that. How do we take all this amazing tips that you just share for content marketing, you know, on different platforms? And how can we apply it to some of the content that is generated for events, particularly to the type of events that, you know, we're discussing now, which is virtual hybrid? Because the reality is content that is fed to an in-person audience might not look as good, might not work as good to a virtual audience, right? It's like, like you said, it's that A, B comparison. And if you have this one flagship event and you didn't get a chance to do your A, B testing, how do you determine what's the best content to choose to satisfy the needs of your audience? Yeah, I mean, if you have any sort of wiggle room, I would build some testing into your plan. So even if it's just, you know, take, you have three keynote speakers that are happy to make some sort of video or something like that talking about their content, I would do that and then kind of see which ones resonated better. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a million different A-B tests that you can do, like try to post them at different times on different channels, you know, make a funnier graphic, whatever, but try to keep them similar so that you can try to do that A-B testing. And, and if you figure out that there is a certain type of speaker or a certain type of content that's resonating, then build on that. Right. Make that part of your plan so that it's like, OK, speaker C was the one that really people seem to be attracted to. And then, you know, if you know your audience, you can kind of just look into that a little bit and be like, OK, this seems to be working. How do I how do I build more of that? How do mm -hmm. I record more of that with, with my speakers? So when you can do something like that, I think it makes a lot of sense. You have to place your bets. Right. Ultimately, you can't just leave everything open and be like, oh, we're going to try one video. And then if that works, we'll make a lot of video. Like that's not going to work, right? You have to make your plans. You have to place your bets. Yeah. But it really helps to know your audience, you know, and, and especially if you're working with an audience that you don't know that well, it really helps to know somebody or to, to kind of connect with somebody in the audience to kind of take that further. I'll give you a very quick example. I was working for the European Society for Organ Transplantation. So transplant surgeons and anybody connected to transplanting organs. Mm -hmm. And we had a, you know, a newsletter, we did email marketing, and they were pretty tried to spruce up the design. It was very easy, one story, one click, one thing, try to get people to go to the website and read more. And we realized that wasn't working very well. Mm -hmm. And what we realized was that transplant surgeons don't tend to have an office. Transplant surgeons are usually on their feet. Mm -hmm. If they're not operating, they're essentially spending a lot of time in waiting rooms, mm -hmm. waiting for organs to come through. And then once an organ comes through, it's like, boom, drop everything, go. Yeah. So they end up doing a lot on their phones or on tablets or something like that. And so it's not easy for them to kind of click on something, go to a website, do all this kind of thing. So what we ended up doing is we started actually putting the whole article or the whole story 
in the newsletter. So it made these really long email newsletters that nobody would normally advise you to create. But in this case, for this specific audience, that worked because they knew that once they opened the email, they had the whole story. They could read the whole thing wherever they were and they could move on with their day. So those kind of details, I think, are really important for you to understand what is it that that particular audience sees yeah. value in or, or, or maybe there's something in the way they operate that kind of makes more sense. And in this example, I can see how, you know, a surgeon, a professional in the medical field, it's also used to like the super long research papers that are like 20 papers long. Like someone like me goes, you know, the beginning in the middle and at the end. And hopefully I get the idea <laughs> from all of yeah. that, missing everything in between. Exactly. But it's very interesting. I, um, I like that analogy, the example you brought, because it's so true, like knowing who your audience is. And even if you don't, at least creating some type of a persona, I think in marketing, this is talked about like over and beyond, right? Like having the ideal persona, who are you trying to market to? Who is your event serving? And then going with that in mind. Now, as we're warmed up, I want to ask you something in regards to, you know, the future of virtual and hybrid events with all the knowledge and data that we currently have at hand. What is your opinion of what's going to happen with our event? Events, especially in the light of the new challenges that our industry is facing as we speak. And if you were to maybe, you know, tell your future self, because by the time this episode will air, that's technically in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that would be a future version of us, you know, looking back and listening to our thoughts today. So welcome to an episode of Back to the Future. <laughs> what would be your opinion on what the future of virtual hybrid events is? Let me consult my crystal ball. <laughs> You actually have one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's always hard to predict. And I don't know exactly what they look like, what they will look like, or what they look like right now, if you're listening to this in the future. What I can say is technology developed really fast in the last you know, year and a half. And also the way we use technology has developed really fast. So we're not going to put up with bad virtual events. If the technology is not working properly, if it's not well constructed, we're going to log off pretty quickly. So the bar has been raised for all types of events. And I think, yeah, that sort of engagement, that getting things really, really interesting, no matter how you're consuming the event is really important. I don't think that every event is going to go hybrid. I think hybrid, particularly if you really mean hybrid, like simultaneous and, and you know, high investment, high production value hybrid is, is going to be exclusive for, you know, events that can really be like TV, events that can have that kind of production and where that kind of production can be done and the on-site experience still be positive. Because if you also create an event where it is a TV studio and you tell people to be quiet and clap and those kind of things, then it's not a great experience for the, you know, the in-person event. I don't know if you've ever been to a TV recording studio, but it's like you're sort of hired help, right? You have to sort of clap at the right times and you have to repeat certain scenes. And it's, 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 it's quite painful. And, and usually there's sort of like free tickets to sort of make sure people are happy and there's free alcohol and stuff just to keep everybody <laughs> smiling and, and clapping at the right time. So I don't think that's going to be within reach of most events. I do think that virtual events are definitely here to stay. And I think that... A lot of events just make more sense virtually. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of events, if your association is able to create a really good virtual event and it reaches more people and there's more people around the world that can connect with the content and find it interesting, then I think what's going to happen is we're going to kind of have to figure out which events work best virtually and which events work best hybrid or possibly in person only, but I think it almost feels like a waste to me to have an event that's purely in person, because if you have good content, then why not capture it in some way and make it into something that people can consume online? When it comes to just networking events, then I think it makes sense maybe to just do in person. But I think uh, a lot of events will make more sense virtually. For that to really happen, we go back to that business model question. You know, a lot of associations also depend on the revenue from events to really survive and to have money to do other things. So going virtual will only make sense if they can offset that revenue in other ways, right? Like it's probably going to be less expensive to make these events online, but they still need to be able to get a lot more money coming in than I think most of them are doing right now. So that business model is going to have to evolve. But I, I would say there's probably going to be less events and there's probably going to be more of those, those really large events where you really have to be there. I think those are going to continue. 
I think the smaller regional events are going to be successful and, and some of them will be online. I, I fear a little bit for the ones in between, mm -hmm. the ones that are sort of not quite community-led small events, but not quite mega events where they're sort of large, but because I think with, with, with travel policies being uh, strict and, and difficult and, you know, a lot of people still being afraid of traveling, you know, for right or wrong, I, I'm not going to comment on that. People are going to make big choices. And I, and I think most people are going to go to the, the big event, whether it's the Web Summit or CES or, you know, the bigger medical event in their field. But they may skip on some of the other ones and then go more local or go for the online version. So I think those events that are sort of in the middle are probably the ones that have the biggest business case for building a good hybrid experience mm -hmm. because people are going to be second guessing whether they're going to go. And if they can create a virtual experience that is enjoyable and gets to the point quickly and can be really good, then I think they have a shot. If they don't, then unfortunately, I don't think they're, they're going to survive too much. So, you know, that's a long answer to saying, I think events are going to have a lot of technology. And where events have a business model that works and they can give people that choice to go online or in person, then I think there's a good reason for them to be hybrid and hopefully they can, they can make it work financially. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot to go into that, a lot to unpack. I wish we had the time to go into each one of those elements. But following up on the, the previous question, would you share some of your maybe top tips and tricks when it comes to all the technology tools that is now available that would help some of the event planners and organizers prepare for and thrive in this future of events? Sure. I have a little bit of a sort of structure to this that I like to talk about. I like to talk about uh, a certain order of events. So first is concept, mm -hmm. uh, then is process, and then is tools. And I, and I think those three things need to go in that order. You need to first have a really good concept for your event, which is the design. It's the kind of creativity. It's how are we going to engage people? What are we going to ask them? Are we going to put them in groups? What are we going to do? And really kind of thinking about the experience that everybody has. Mm -hmm. And then figuring out the process to get there. And that includes, you know, how you invite the speakers. How does that work? How do people register? How do you market the event? Those are all sort of process things. Mm -hmm. And the last thing for me is the tools. So how do you actually you know, choose the tools that are the right tools to do all these things. Now, those should go in the order, but I realize that if you're not familiar with what the tools are capable of doing, it's very hard for you to kind of conceptualize and create the processes. So I actually feel like you need to go and research those tools. But once you find what the tools are capable of and find tools that are sort of in your price range, then don't kind of contract right away. Don't get stuck with a tool uh, before you do your concept and your process phase. So for me, it's like, okay, let's, let's come up with the ideas and then let's go and find the tools afterwards that, that kind of make sense. But we need to kind of have an idea of what they do. So I'll, I'll do a short plug for our site, Event MB. Um, we do a number of reports, including the Virtual Event Tech Guide and Event at Bible, for example. So those are two great guides that we compare. Not, it, it's almost impossible to compare every tool, but we compare on the Virtual Event Tech Guide, we compare 102 tools in the latest edition. And we go into a lot of detail about the features they have and how they, how, what support level they have and, and how do you purchase, like is it per person, per attendee, or is there a package deal? So there's a lot of details in there. And that's a place for you to go and, and, and just have a, have a look at what's out there because there's so many tools up showing up all the time. And I think it's very important also to, to get some personal recommendations because I think these kind of tools that, the, that we provide are great to create like a short list. You know, you could have a short list of tools. Hey, I'm considering these maybe four tools. That's a good place to be. Like three, four is a good place to be. And then speaking with people that that use the tools. And if you're, you know, if you're doing a big contract with one of these providers, then get them to introduce you to their clients. You know, get them, ask them like, hey, can I speak to someone who does a similar event to what I'm looking to do to get their experience? And if they don't want to introduce you to them, then that's probably a bad sign. Right. You, you want to kind of have an open conversation to people with people about that. And, uh, and I think that's where the magic happens. And just to keep in mind, there is no perfect tool. There is no perfect virtual event platform. Many times to create the optimal uh, or the best fit for an event, you have to mix more than one tool. So I would always consider not just buying the tool that does everything, because the chances are that it doesn't do everything really well. It just does everything. And mm -hmm. so it might be better to find you know, an audience response tool that's really cool that you may need to do a little integration, but then you get what you're looking for rather than, oh, this platform does polls, but that's it. 
you know, and you're like, ah, I wanted something else, right? So, so there's, yeah, it, it's important to get that tech stack right, but but I wouldn't then make it limit you because the danger is if you focus too much on the tech stack, then it limits your creativity for what you want to do in your event, and and that's a shame. Absolutely. Well, as we're coming to time here, Miguel, thank you so much for all your insight and the tips and tricks that you've shared so far with our audience. If you had one piece of advice to give, what would that be? And also, if you can tell our audience where they could connect and learn more about you, please do so. Again, so, so much good stuff here. I, I can't stop the recording, but I know we have to. <laughs> no <one laughs> problem. Could always, could always have another chat some other time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, find, find us over at EventMB. So EventMB.com or Event Manager blog, if you spell it out, that's the same site. Uh, on LinkedIn and all the social media channels. And I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. Search for Miguel7 and 7 spelt out S-E-V-E-N. That will be me on Twitter. And if you search for that on LinkedIn, you will also find me. Uh, it's just my nickname when I was early in my computer days. That was the, the nickname I used for all the channels and it just stuck. Uh, my last name spelled backwards spells 7. So it's just a fun way to, to kind of have an online name. And one piece of advice to part One, one piece of advice, I guess, yeah, this isn't very technical, but I, I think you know, as I kind of progressed in my career, I've, you know, read a lot of management things and try to figure out, especially, you know, time management and trying to just be better at, at doing things. And I feel like energy is a really important part of any work that you do. And so I feel like when you're in a project, when you're doing, especially around events, I feel like if it doesn't feel good, if it's not like a hell yeah, let's do this, then think about saying no to stuff. Because I think if you, if you say no to stuff and if you kind of free up the time for something that you're very passionate about, then you find the right fit. And, you know, I think my, my role at Event MB is a bit of an example of that. You know, I had a, a number of job offers. I wasn't looking for a job, but I had a number of job offers at sort of the, the start of the year for whatever reason that that was a time when, when things started being suggested to me. And I, I said no to a lot of things. And then this came about and I was like, yeah, yeah, this is good. I could do this. And, you know, I still feel very good about it. So I feel like that was a, a time when I made a good choice and I was able to free up my mental capacity and my mm -hmm. time to do something that I'm really passionate about. And I think the more we can do that, of course, you know, there's difficult situations and sometimes we just have to take whatever work comes, but the more we yeah. can be conscious of the things that are going to give us energy, then I think the outcomes will be more positive. So I, I hope, I hope people can kind of recognize themselves in that. And that's when, you know, whatever work you're doing doesn't feel like work anymore because you're actually doing something that you enjoy and it's fun. <laughs> Mm. Well, it was so cool. good having you on, Miguel. Thank you so much for the time that you allocated to this and all the amazing tips and tricks and knowledge that you share with our audience. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and we get to do this again because we still have a lot of things. I mean, I barely touch on four questions, okay? I have another 20. So we got to do this again sometime soon. Sure. <laughs> Probably no next problem. year where we have to go back in time and be like, Hmm. You know yeah, what? That would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> kind of go back and see. So that did that make any sense? Was that actually what happened? And uh, you know, hopefully next year we'll be post pandemic and we'll have a choice and we'll be doing things because we we want to do them in a certain way. And yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you for having me, and I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you, Miguel. Okay, friends, this is it for today's episode. I mean, a lot of information that we packed into today. I feel like I didn't even touch <laughs> on all the things that I wanted to, but I've gotten so much more and that is amazing. I am super grateful for our guest today that shared all the tips and all the wisdom and knowledge that he's acquired over his time and events and can't wait to air this out. Thank you so much for all of you listening here in the US as well as around the world. I am super grateful for you and wherever you tuning in from please do take a moment to subscribe on your favorite listening platform and if you want to take it you know like one step further maybe please leave a five-star review to make this podcast visible to more event professionals like yourself or maybe just screenshot the podcast I mean we all look kind of good I did my hair today so yeah share this podcast with your network <laughs> 
<laughs> seriously, don't share it because of my hair. Just share it because it's a lot of good information that a lot of other design professionals could tap into and learn. Right now, I'm actually rewarding five loyal listeners to receive some really cool podcast swag. And all you have to do is to email me a screenshot of the either five-star review or the podcast that you shared on your social. And if you could email it at podcast at trifanevents.com or maybe even DM it on my Instagram events, demystify podcast, that would be fantastic. And I will personally mail you the swag. As always, I welcome your feedback. Keep that coming. If I'm a little slow getting back, just know that life has been happening a little fast and crazy for the last few weeks. So just have a little bit of patience with me and grace. I also open WhatsApp so you can reach me on WhatsApp, which I feel like it's a little faster of a response. And I will have all the links in the episode notes. That's about it. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Until next time. <laughs>